VO2max. What actually is VO2max? It is the maximal amount of oxygen an athlete can take up during hard exercise. Coaches, but also researchers, have used this metric to assess how aerobically fit a person is. Endurance athletes have reported the highest VO2max, while strength athletes or sedentary people have typically lower VO2max. But what about CrossFit athletes? They do strength and endurance at the same time. They are super fit, so they must have a very high VO2max too, right? I did a study in collaboration with the University of Basel to find out. In that study, we measured the view to max of 60 well-trained and world-class CrossFit athletes. In this video, I will discuss why CrossFit athletes have a lower view to max than you would think. I will discuss the physiological reasons why and how you can use this information as a coach or an athlete. Ready for it? Let's dig into it. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Gomar. I'm a researcher at ETH Zurich based in Switzerland. And for the last decade or so, I studied the impact of nutrition as well as exercise on muscle mass and health. And now I want to provide some of that science back to you guys. First of all, what is VO2 max? VO2 max is the maximal amount of oxygen an athlete can take up. Right? And it's typically measured in, we call this a ramp test to exhaustion, where an athlete has to run or bike or row always at a higher intensity until he or she cannot yeah, perform anymore or when he or she is completely exhausted. And then we measured amount of oxygen the person actually can take up mostly by the muscles. And you can see here that the oxygen uptake increases linearly with the intensity. That makes sense, right? The more energy is needed to move, let's say, the pedals, to also the more oxygen is needed to propel the muscles. And at the end, so when the person is almost at exhaustion, you see that you can reach a plateau. This means that even though the intensity increases, the oxygen uptake, the oxygen uptake actually doesn't increase anymore. And that is your true VO2 max. You can also have, let's say, a VO2 peak, we call this, and that is just when there's no plateau, it's just the, the, the oxygen uptake reaches a, a typical peak and then it drops down because the athlete is exhausted. So that's, that's one, that's how you typically define it. And it all has to do with the Fick equation. So VO2 can be defined as the cardiac output, so how much oxygen you can deliver, how much uh, oxygenated blood you can deliver to the uh, tissues, times the arterial venous oxygen difference. That's a difficult word for just how much oxygen the muscle can actually uh, utilize or extract from the oxygenated blood that is entering the, the muscle. Okay, so that is always uh, something you have to, to look at. Not only the heart, how much you can pump out, how much oxygenated blood you can pump out, but also uh, how much you can obviously use by the muscle. And that's an important point for later in this discussion. So Bengt Saltin, who is one of the most famous physiologists ever lived, he uh, unfortunately died in 2014. He did a lot of super cool studies. So if you're interested in physiology and, and, and VO2 max, just look up his word, uh, work, Bengt Saltin. And he did, already in the 70s, he did a study where he assessed the view to max of different types of sporting or athletes, right? And then you have, for example, here at the top, you have the skiing or the cross-country skiers, the runners, the speed skaters. They obviously have very high view to max because they need to produce a lot of energy aerobically. And here you can see they measured uh, here five athletes and they came up to 80 milliliter oxygen per kilogram body weight. So that's a relative way of saying how much oxygen someone uh, can take up, right? So you always divide it by the body weight. So elite elite uh, endurance athletes uh, have reported above 90, really the maximum of oxygen uptake. Then when you go down the line, you see more uh, less aerobic sports, such as biathlon, walking, canoeing, uh, ski alpine, running 400 meters, so more the, the, the sprinters. And then you also have a whole more at the bottom, so where the VO2 max is quite low, 40 to 50, would be wrestling, weightlifting, or untrained people, as you would expect. Good, so more combat sports or strength sports. So what about CrossFit athletes? That's always something that was in my mind, because CrossFit athletes, they do a lot of strength work, a lot, but also a lot of endurance work. And also a lot of, let's say, mixed work, where they combine strength and endurance at, let's say, one session or even one workout. What about their VO2 max? Must be quite high, right? Let's see. So we did a study in collaboration with uh, the University of Basel, where we tested 
60 world-class to well-trained CrossFit athletes. I'm talking about games athletes, semi-finalist athletes and all quarter-final athletes. So a good group of trained uh, people, 30 men, 30 women. And we, we subjected them to a battery of tests uh, where we also assessed their body weight, their anthropometrics, uh, their lung function, and also how, how uh, good their friend time was and their one RM back squat. But also we measured them aerobically, so with, with a mask, so testing their VO2 max and their endurance uh, capacity, and also several strength uh, tests. So a typical physiological profiling that you could do in the lab with also other types of athletes. I will put the link to this uh, study in the description so you can read, read through this study because now I will only talk about the VO2 max but we measured uh, several other things. And what you can immediately see here is that we defined well-trained athletes as anyone who was in the top 5 percentile of the Open, right, but did not make it to the semi-finals. That's important. And then the elites also were a, a sub-cohort of people who made it to the semi-finals or the game. So really, really well-trained uh, athletes, right? And then males and females. And you can see here that the elite CrossFit athletes only had 56 on average VO2 max. So that's, we can call this moderate, right? Like decent, it's, it's obviously not sedentary, but it's also not the same as a well-trained endurance athlete. The same for the women who had 51 on a relative basis. For some who was asking, absolute VO2 max was also not substantially high, right? So let's say a mediocre VO2 max. So obviously this is one study, right? So I was looking at other studies in the literature where they reported a VO2 max of well-trained athletes, CrossFit athletes, and they all were sitting, you can see here the studies, at around 47 to uh, 50 of uh, milliliters O2. So it's not a very uh, high VO2 max, at least not what is reported into the literature, which corresponds well to our study in very well-trained athletes. So the question is, why do these CrossFit athletes have such a relatively low VO2 max? And before I go into this, I want to talk briefly about a new platform we are collaborating with. It's called Strivy. And it's a platform where coaches can put on their programming so the athletes can just see what, what they have programmed this week or this month. It's a very user-friendly program or a software. And why I recommend it is because we at WhatScience are actively collaborating with them to improve their features. For example, something I always wanted but never found in other programs was how to implement RPE or rate of perceived exertion for every session so that the athlete can actually provide their RPE per session. What is cool about Strive-V, the actual developers are helping us to implement some of our features into the platform. I think you can also benefit from those. So if you use the link in the description below, you get 10% off your first subscription. And also we get a little kickback which supports the channel and supports the page. So if you're interested in Strive-V, just have a look in the link in the description. So why do CrossFit athletes have a lower VO2 max? There's several explanations. I have four of them that I think are important, but obviously they always intertwine and not one is separately determining. Good, first of all, if you think about the CrossFit, right? So the CrossFit Games 2007 compared to now are completely different. And I think, except for this year, but all the previous years, CrossFit was quite heavily strength biased. Think about snatches. If you, at this point, cannot snatch 285 as a male and whatever, 190 as a female, you will not make it to the semis or certainly not to the games. So you need to have a certain amount of strength, let's say 280 snatch. You don't want to be too weak. If you're too weak, you don't make it to the top. If you're too strong, that's probably also not the goal of the coach and the athlete, because then you probably will have to fail or have uh, weaknesses on the other part, for example, endurance. So always think about at the middle size of the bell curve. Good. So strength biased CrossFit, that's one. So that's one reason why top athletes or well-trained athletes don't have the same VO2 max as an elite cyclist because obviously the elite cyclist needs much less strength and much more endurance capacity. This ties well with the second reason, which is the interference effect. Interference means basically that strength impacts endurance or conditioning or conditioning impacts strength gains. 
right? I did a, a big video on this uh, not so long ago, which pops up above on your screen. It's also linked in the description where I uh, explain how and what's the best way to combine strength and endurance for hybrid athletes. So if you want to learn more about that, just, just have a look. So interference, why is this important? If you, are, if you are a CrossFit athlete, you have, let's say, 30 hours of training time per week, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less, doesn't really matter, right? And you always have to divide your training time between endurance, mixed and strength. You, you, you always have to kind of combine them some way or another, on different sessions or on the same session, whatever, right? While on the other hand, an endurance athlete, he or she, can do 90% of the work in endurance and only 5% will be strength. So obviously on the long term, after five, six, seven, eight years of training, the endurance part would be much more developed in an endurance athlete compared to a CrossFit athlete, just because of the volume or the accumulated volume into one modality or the other. And that's important to understand because it's known from, from previous studies, and, and actually there's a lot of data about this, is that if you do concurrent training, which is basically doing endurance and strength in the same session or at least in close proximity, certainly in moderately trained and highly trained athlete, there will be some kind of interference where one modality will actually have some kind of plateau uh, compared to yeah, the other modalities. This you can really nicely see if you have a look at the data from our CrossFit study where I just talked about. What we did here is we compared the results from our cohort of CrossFit athletes to, um, let's say, real experts in the field. For example, the VO2max of our cohort of, of, of athletes, where the CrossFit athletes had a VO2max of, let's say, 50 to 55. And then we compared it to, uh, to the VO2max of elite cyclists. And here you can very nicely see that on the endurance side of things, also, let's say, critical power and, 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 and um, threshold power. So we're sitting at 75% of the values of elite cyclists in endurance sports. It's a bit less I'm not going to say problematic or at least less interference in the strength part. You can see, for example, counter movement height. Actually, there, the CrossFit athletes were close to the same values as elite weightlifters. Here, I'm talking about the males. Also, for the females, you see a similar pictures where mostly the endurance va values are at least 10 to 15 percent lower than their female specialists, their counterparts but, but specialists. And then you also have the strength parameters who are less affected by the interference effect, okay? So that's quite interesting. Is That is something that long-term concurrent training would do. So back to our reasons. Reason number three is a little bit more biochemical. Here you see a depiction of the muscle fibers and the pink lines here are the capillaries. And obviously the capillaries are small blood vessels that provide oxygen to the working tissue or the muscle fibers. And how it works is that the oxygen arrives and then it diffuses towards, let's say, the middle or at least more inside the muscle fiber towards the mitochondria, which then obviously use the oxygen to provide energy via the electron transport chain. Good. So, you have to think about it that the oxygen has to diffuse, passively diffuse into the middle of the muscle fiber. And the more capillaries you have, the easier this diffusion goes. So when you have an endurance trained athlete, he has small muscle fibers, relatively small, it doesn't have big muscles, and a lot of capillaries. But then you also have a strength biased or more a CrossFit athlete. We all know that CrossFit athletes, they are strong, they have a lot of muscle mass, and there the capillary to muscle size or muscle fiber ratio decreases, meaning that the muscle size is bigger than the amount of capillaries. So the diffusion of oxygen is going to be more difficult for a CrossFit athlete than for an endurance trained athlete. And that's why just the amount of muscle mass can probably interfere with the aerobic capacity of a CrossFit athlete. And then we have the fourth one, and that is not really physiological, but also an important thing to, to, to mention. There's also a method of testing. What we did, we put those CrossFit athletes on a stationary bike and we let them bike until exhaustion. Obviously, CrossFit athletes sometimes hop on a C2 bike, but they're much less familiar with such a movement than, for example, a cyclist or a rower with a rowing machine. A CrossFit athlete is much more familiar with burpees, snatches, pull-ups or thrusters, right? And I found a study that was recently published where they actually tested the VO2 max of CrossFit athletes while doing FRAN 
which is obviously we all know 21 15 9 of thrusters and pull-ups and that is obviously something we didn't do yet and that is not a lot of data on it where we could use more crossfit specific movements to test the vo2 max of athletes and then maybe you would see much different results for example a good way to test this would be from kind of dead by thrusters and pull-ups for example you put on a mask as depicted here on the athlete and the first minute you let them do one thruster one pull-up second minute two thrusters two pull-ups until exhaustion it's similar as a ramp test to exhaustion but with crossfit specific movements and if you would do such a test in highly skilled highly trained athletes you likely in my opinion would see higher vo2 maxes compared to what we just tested so the question arises what can i do with that information we know now that crossfit athletes because of the strength and also the interference don't have the highest vo 2 max ever reported right they have much less endurance capacity likely than elite cyclists or elite runners that's one so if you then go back to our study we actually tested if there would be a correlation between the vo 2 max of a specific athlete and their open rank so how well they performed in the open and here you can see certainly in the men there was actually no correlation literally zero correlation there was a very weak correlation in the women who, which was statistically significant but it was not very strong good so maybe vo2 max is not a super important determining factor for performance in crossfit indeed we actually found that anthropometrics so how long your femurs are how long your arms are is much more important in determining your open rank as an elite athlete that's something to consider so height definitely plays a role here so as a coach it might make more sense to not just focus on view to max or absolute or maximal oxygen uptake but rather on movement efficiency and using oxygen uptake during tests of movement efficiency for example if you have a portable oxygen analyzer right oxygen uptake analyzer you could do certain movements and try to improve the movement efficiency so that you can do the same amount of work at a lower oxygen uptake that would be much more useful for an athlete than just testing their maximal oxygen uptake which anyway doesn't really define elite performance all right that was a long one. Thank you for sticking uh, until the end. This was uh, hopefully quite valuable for you. If you found this interesting, give us a like and also a subscribe. It really helps out the channel. For me, that was it. See you in the next one. Ciao.